So we're kind of in a little bit of a transition period when it comes to what we're doing on Sunday for Sunday morning worship. Uh, we just got done with the series on Philippians a couple weeks ago, and so we've had like a month off or so in between where we've kind of been able to talk about what, what we want to, uh, and so like uh, sticking in, in one specific book. And, and so Steve kind of focused on end times and, and, and things of that nature. Then my first sermon, I kind of talked about, hey, we're not just supposed to listen to the Bible, but we're actually supposed to apply the Bible to our life. And uh, so in a couple weeks after homecoming, we're going to open up and look at New Testament characters. And so we're really excited about that. Uh, but I had kind of a free week here to kind of do what I wanted. And so uh, there's two texts that I try to preach once a year here at Lodge. There's two of them. You may say, Brett, are you doing that because you're lazy? Kind of. It's football season. So my time is no, obviously. Uh, it's not because I'm lazy. It's because I believe that these texts are so important to hear. Uh, quite often, we need to be reminded of something we already know. Uh, we forget everything, especially in the culture that we live in now where everything's so fast and our mind is always moving 100 miles an hour. We forget the things that are important. And so the two texts that I preach once a year, I do that on purpose because I think it's easy for us to drift away from the mission that God has for us. And it's easy for us to drift away from, from these ideas that these texts bring up. And so what we're going to see today is something super simple and something you would probably say with your mouth. Uh, but something that's really hard to live out, and quite often we drift away from it, is this idea that Jesus is king of our life. Quite often, we start getting focused on the wrong things, and we start having the wrong dreams. And, and our dreams, while they may be good things, they become the wrong things. Our, our dream is to become a great football coach. Our dream is to become a horse racer. Our dream is to become great at my job. My dream is to create this amazing family, right? All good things, but we forget about the main dream, the good dream, which is that Jesus is king of our life. So we're going to take a look at that. It's not going to be new information, uh, but I think it's something that we need to be reminded of. So if you got your Bibles, we're going to be in Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. So it says, and when he, being Jesus, returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. So Jesus is at his home. This was his home base in Capernaum. He didn't probably actually own the house. It was probably someone else's house, but it's the place where he could stay while he was at home. And houses back then were not very big, especially in Capernaum. It was maybe, if you've been back in the nursery, the house was maybe that size. It could fit about 50 people in there standing and so this house is packed. There's 50, about 50 people standing inside. There's people standing outside of the door and outside of the windows listening to Jesus preach. I was thinking about this, and this is the first time this has hit me from this text. My house is like my comfy spot, right? Like, it's the place where I can sit back, relax, and just be me. I, I don't have to try hard. I can just sit back, and it's my place where I go to relax, which is good, but it's like my, it's my comfy spot. Jesus, at this point, had been out doing miracles. He had been healing people. He had been preaching the kingdom, been doing all these amazing things. You think what he would want to do is come home to his comfy spot and just relax. Sit back, take off his sandals, watch the donkey graze in the backyard, and just relax, right? But he doesn't. What he does is he opens up his house for ministry. He doesn't just go home and relax, which can't be good. He opens up his house, and it becomes more than just his comfy spot. It becomes more than just his place to relax. So often, I think we in America, we don't use our house as, a, as if it's under God's authority. We don't use our house as a place to do ministry or to, to love and serve people. We use it as a place where we just relax, recharge, and then we go back out. But what God is calling us to do is to be people who submit our whole life to him, right? Jesus is king of our whole life, which means he's king of our house. And he wants us to use our homes and our houses to love God and to love people. I've had great examples of this in my life. My parents were very good at it. But there's one guy recently in my life who I think is a phenomenal example of it. His name is Scott, and it's not the Scott that some of you know. He's a football coach on our staff. I met him a couple years ago. We were looking for a new coach. I called him. I was like, hey, you want to coach with us? He said, sure. And so he lives in Rantoul, and here's what he does every Monday night. Every Monday night, he invites all the linemen over to his house. He cooks them food. He's a phenomenal cook. Like, he used to own a smokehouse, so he, he really knows what he's doing. There's good cooks in their sky. He's an amazing cook. And so he cooks for them every Monday. We watch film together. We sit down and have a meal. And then most recently, what we decided to start doing was sharing a devotional with them, right? 
And so we sit down and we talk to them about Jesus. Two weeks ago, he talked about discipline. Last week, I talked about identity, and I got to just straight up share the gospel with a bunch of our football players, which is awesome. That opportunity does not happen if Scott is not open to, or is not willing to open his house. That situation does not happen if Scott just thinks of his house as his comfy place, as a place to go relax and to sit and to take off his shoes. To Scott, his house is a place to do ministry. It's a place to love and serve people. I often make excuses in my life about my house because I basically, I don't, I don't live in a trailer, but it's basically the size of a trailer. It has like a, a kitchen and a dining room, a wall in between it with a front room, and then we have a little hallway with two, two bedrooms and, and a bathroom. And I often think to myself, man, I can't have people over at my house. It's too small. What if my football players sit on my couch and break it? What if it's too small that one of my players run into the wall and put a hole in it? And I often make these excuses, like God can't use my comfy place to, to do ministry, to love God and love people. And uh, I've come to realize that that's an excuse I'm making in my heart. And that's an excuse that I'm making because I don't want to use my comfy space for something other than just to relax and to chill. And so God is calling you also not to use your house as just a place to look pretty and to relax in, but a place to bring people over to, a place to have meals with people, and a place to love people and to serve them. I know right now I can tell it makes some of you feel uncomfortable to think I'm bringing people over to my house. Like I have to have them come into my house. It, it's hard and it's awkward and it's weird sometimes, but it's through those opportunities that God often moves. And we see this in the life of Jesus. When Jesus opened his house up, we see probably hundreds of people here getting to hear the message that Jesus is bringing, all right? So, a bunch of people over at Jesus' house, and then it says this in verse 3. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not hear him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And so, four men come bringing the really good friend on a stretcher, basically. And this guy on the stretcher is a paralytic, which means he can't walk. And they get to the house. If you read this text actually in Matthew, the same narrative, same story, what we see is the people at the house are actually religious people. There are a bunch of Pharisees who are listening to Jesus teach, right? Basically, like, kind of like a modern-day pastor. But there are a bunch of religious people listening to Jesus teach. What happens is this person who is sick and broken comes to the door but they can't get in because the religious people have put a door in between Jesus and the broken. What they have done is they've literally blocked the broken person out. Like, if I see someone coming to Jesus and they can't walk, I'm going to step out of the way and let them go to Jesus. But these religious people will not let him in. And here's what I've realized. is often we put up a door in between the broken and Jesus. We put up a door between the broken and Jesus. Uh, Sometimes it's on purpose, right? I've heard stories, crazy stories, where, I don't know, someone walks in the church wearing a hat like a kid, and then someone kicks them out, or where someone straight up judges them for the addiction or the problem or the sin that they have. But I think a lot of times the door that we put up is actually accidental. Like, we don't mean to put up a door between the religious and Jesus, but we accidentally do. And I'm going to talk about something which I think may be a little offensive, and, uh, oh, I felt like I had enough trust to kind of talk about this, uh, because I'm coming from the perspective that I feel like gets judged. But I think a lot of times, please hear me, I love you guys, and I care about you guys. Please understand this is coming from a place of love and not hate. I think a lot of times, older Christians put up a door in between, young, between Jesus and young people who don't know Jesus. I think a lot of times, older Christians can put up a door in between Jesus and young people who don't know Jesus. I'm going to talk about why here. Uh, I wanted to be very specific in what I was saying, so I didn't get off track here. So let me get over to my notes. I think that we, like older, mature Christians, can act like there was a golden age of Christianity. Like there was some period, whether it was in the 60s, 70s, 80s, I don't know when it is for you, but there was some golden age of Christianity. And what we need to do is get back to that golden age of Christianity. But the truth is, there has never been a golden age of Christianity. There will be one day, it's when Jesus returns, but every culture that has ever happened has had great things happen within it, and really broken things happen within it. Each culture, whether across 
the whole entire spectrum of cultures, you know, from the beginning of the world to the end, there'll be cultures with great things and cultures that have really broken, messed up things about it. When you study history and you study culture, you see that everything is it's so good, but it's so bad at the same time. Maybe in your head, you look back to the 60s, and you're like, that was the golden period of Christianity, right? That was when things were going good and everyone was at church, right? And that's awesome, and that's good. But simultaneously, at the same time, America was filled with racism and hatred for each other, right? Good things going on, bad things going on. Maybe you look back to the 90s when uh, Steve talks about the church picnic, right? And everything was going good, and, and churches were growing. But at the same time, from what I've heard, there was a lot of self-righteousness within churches, and there was a lot of judgment going on. And you look right now, and you're like, man, things are just so horrible and so bad. We've got people who can't decide if they're girls or guys. we got babies being killed in, a, in abortion clinics. And you think these things are true, right? But at the same time, like, America is fighting for racial equality. And at the same time, I believe by, like, the end of the 2000s, like, you know, 2077, some people are projecting world hunger will be gone. Right? There's bad things going on, but at the exact same time, there's good things going on. This world is jacked up. It's always been jacked up, and it's always going to be jacked up. There is no point in history you can point back to and be like, man, things were so great and so awesome. If you think about it, 200 years ago, you could literally kill someone and, and not have any judgment for it in certain places. Even certain places today, right? You can just go and kill someone. That, that seems pretty messed up to me. That seems more messed up than someone decide, trying to figure out if they're a girl or a guy, right? There's always brokenness going on. There's always hatred going on. And the thing is, is now we just have more access to it. Like 200 years ago, your neighbor could be killed five miles away from you, and you would never have known about it because you never even knew your neighbor. Now we have access to every good thing and every bad thing that happens, and it's all in our face. So what I'm trying to say is the world is bad, but it's always been bad, and it's always going to be messed up and jacked up. At the same time, God is also going to do great things in this world as well. And so here's what happens. The culture is not our enemy. We look at the culture and we make the culture our enemy. You know who our enemy is? It's Satan. Satan is our enemy. People are not our enemies. People that we try to hate, we try to despise, they're not the enemies. Satan using them and working in them is the one who is the enemy. Biden is not your enemy. Trump is not your enemy. Satan is your enemy. And you know how we defeat our enemy? We love and serve the people that he's using. We love and serve the people around us. That's how we defeat Satan, and that's how we transform the life of our enemies, or our, our so-called enemies. It's when they see the work of Jesus in your heart, the work of Jesus in your life, that they see the, the tangible gospel, and the Holy Spirit works through them and changes them. The truth is, if we should be picking on someone, we should be picking on ourselves. If we're going out and making people our enemies, the truth is, we're actually the enemy. I heard someone say this this past week. Uh, he said that the thing we need rescued from most is not the bad news outside of us, but the bad news inside of us. The thing we need rescued from most is not the bad news outside of us, but the bad news inside of us. This guy named Paul Tripp said this. He says, why does every time I get a flat tire, it brings me 75% of the way towards atheism? Like, why when I get a flat tire, do I just like freak out and act like there's no God that exists, and I just get mad and angry and frustrated with everything around me? It's because the bad news that I need taken care of is not girls becoming guys and guys becoming girls or whatever that bad news is that you define our culture by. The bad news you need changed from is what's inside of you, that anger and hatred and frustration. And so the world is not our enemy, but, uh, but Satan is. I'll give you one example, and then we'll move on from this. I'll give you one example. So this past week and a half, so you know my sons have been sick. Originally they had RSV. And now Bronson has developed pneumonia in his right lung, and they both still have RSV, and it's miserable. Sterling does really well with it. However, Bronson really, really struggles with being sick. I've talked to you guys a little bit about him. At one point, we thought he was a highly functioning autistic. We've got some real uh, work and took him to some specialists. And they said, well, he's actually probably not that. He has sensory processing disorder. And so when his, he has a really hard time when his senses are off and, and when, with like, how to handle certain things and touch certain things. And so we've been taking him to OT and working on that. It's been going really good. Like, he's had so much progress over the past couple months. However, the past week and a half, two weeks of him being sick has been miserable. There was one day alone where I was yelled at ten times and hit five times by him. Like, all out punched. And it's just like, oh my gosh, it's so frustrating. I want to pick him up and throw him across the room. And if you don't think that's funny, that's because you're not a parent. And when you are, you will see that there's moments where you want to pick your kid up and throw him across the room. 
Uh, and there's been moments where I've lashed out and ye yelled and have been mean and angry. That's because of the evilness that's inside of me. I've seen that come out of me because of what Bronson has been doing to me the past two weeks. And way, way worse is my wife, who's been around it way more than me. Not, she's not way worse than Bronson. <laughs> way, she's had to deal with way worse of the situation than I have, right? So that evilness is inside of us. And so back to this, you know, Jesus, young people. I think when we stand up and we just pick on culture and we talk about all these things that culture is doing wrong, we're pushing people away from Jesus. Now, I'm not saying we should have conversations about these things and talk about the righteousness of God and what's right and what's wrong. But when we make culture the enemy, these are the very culture that young people are growing up in right now. And what you're doing is you're kicking them to the curb saying your culture stinks. And they're like, I don't want anything to do with church because you guys hate my culture. We're making the wrong people the enemy. Satan is the enemy. Culture is not. Satan is the enemy. People are not. And we may be accidentally putting up a door in between the broken and Jesus. The truth is, church is not a place for the morally elite. It's not a place for the super religious. It's a place for the broken. That text I read to you this morning to start off worship, it's actually right after this. Actually, Austin, can you go to the next slide? I actually had it pulled up on here. This text about Jesus sitting with the, the tax collectors and the sinners. Jesus says, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners, right? Church is a place for people who are broken and realize they're broken and realize they need Jesus to continue to shape and change. He does, he works in us, and he makes us more and more righteous and more and more like him. But still, we're still in desperate need for Jesus to work. And if we don't realize that, we're actually the ones putting that door up in between Jesus and those who, who really, really need him, right? And so, back to the text, right? Jesus is at home, and, and 50 people are inside his house, probably another 50 outside listening to him. He's talking, he's teaching. These, these men carry their friend up on a stretcher to the house. They can't get in because the religious people are blocking the door. And so, this is kind of conjecture, but this is my best guess. I imagine friend one looks at friend two and is like, what are we going to do? And friend three is like, I have a really, really bad idea. <laughs> friend four is like, let me hear it. So friend three says, well, how about two of you hold on to, to our friend who's paralyzed on the stretcher and lift him up to me on the roof. And then me and friend four can kind of pull him up on the roof. So they do that. They get him on top of the roof. And they're like, well, what do we do now? And friend one is like, I got another really bad idea. Let's just rip the roof off and we'll just kind of drop him down. And friend two is like, okay, but let's create some sort of ghetto pulley system to drop him down. So they start, as the Greek says, unroofing the roof is what the Greek literally says. So they're ripping off the roof. And I just imagine sediment falling on Jesus' head and everyone looking up, all the religious people, and just see this little hole in the roof. And then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then they drop their friend down with some sort of ghetto pulley system. And the religious people actually get out of the way this time instead of blocking. They make room for this poor man who cannot walk. And then it says this in verse 5, once the man gets in there. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, hold up. This man didn't pray a prayer asking Jesus into his heart. He never confessed his sin. He never, never got down on his knee. The thing is, we're saved. That, that's good. You should do things like that. But we're saved by faith. We're saved by faith. This man is saved completely and wholly because of the faith that he has. That he has. And then we go on here in verse 6. And it says, now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their heart, why does this man speak like this? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or say, rise, take up your bed and walk? So basically what, Je what happens here is the religious people, they start to judge Jesus. Like, only God can forgive sins. Little do they know that Jesus is God, and he's actually reading their minds right there. And as he's reading their minds, he, he realizes what their problem is. And he says, well, what, basically, what's easier to disprove? Is it easier to disprove if you tell someone their sins are forgiven? Or is it easier to disprove if you tell someone they can get up and walk? Obviously, it's the person who can get up and walk, right? Like, you, if he, you pray over him, he doesn't get up and walk, you can disprove that he doesn't have the power to heal. However, forgiveness of sins is in the spiritual realm. That's hard to, hard to disprove. And so Jesus says, which one's harder to do? And so to make his point here in verse 10, Jesus says, But that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw 
anything like this. And so Jesus prays over, that, prays over the paralytic. The man gets up, rolls up his bed. I just imagine the religious people just moving out of his way. Him and his four friends run home. Might even be his first time ever running. Run home and bring the good news with them. I love that story. It's so cool. The main point that we're seeing here, well, two main points, is that Jesus has power to heal and that he has the authority to forgive sin. The main idea of this text is that Jesus has power to heal and that he has the authority to forgive sin. And so we have a question we have to ask ourselves. Is that guy who can heal and forgive, is he the king of our life? That guy who has power to heal and authority to give, have we made him the continual king of our life? Is he king of our household? Do we allow him to use our house and to use our comfy space to love and serve people? Do we believe that he's the king of our culture? Even though culture is all messed up and all jacked up and all wrong, do we believe that he's God and he's in control and power over that? And uh, bad things are going to happen, but he's still God and he's still good. Is he king over our health with the paralytic? Do we believe that no matter what health circumstance we have, no matter what's going on, God is still good, and he's still king over that, and he has power to heal, and he can and sometimes does. And most importantly, do we believe that he's king over our sin? That he came and he lived the perfect life, and he never lied, and he never stole, and he never hated, and he never looked at anyone sexually. He was 100% good, yet he was punished in our place for our sin. Do we believe that he is king over our sin? As we do that, as we believe that Jesus is king over our life, it just transforms our hearts, and transforms the world around us. I'll leave you with one last illustration, and then we'll have kind of some reflection questions to think of. I told you a story at the beginning about my friend Scott, who's a football coach who opened his house. Uh, I, I texted him earlier in the week. I was like, hey, I'm going to use you in an illustration this week. Is that okay? So he calls me. I was like, that's weird. Uh, I thought he would just say yes. So he calls me up. He says, yes, you have permission. I was telling him what I was going to do, and then he says, well, only if you share this. So I, I have to share this. He said that before he met Jesus, he actually did a lot of those same things. He would throw parties and have people over at his house, but he said his motive was two things. One, he wanted people to like him, and he wanted to be the center of attention. And two, he liked to get drunk and have big parties. So that's why he did it. He said, since I've met Jesus, my heart and my motives have completely changed. Now I do this because I want to love God and serve the people around me. I don't do it for attention. I don't do it to get drunk. I do it because I want God to, God's name to be known. Here's the thing. You have giftings, and you have things in your life that God has given you and made you in a unique and special way. God doesn't want to take those things from you and replace them with something else. He just wants to use them for different reasons. He wants to use the giftings and the things that are already in your heart to love God, love people, or as we would say, to do kingdom work. God wants to use what you already have in you to do these things. And so my first reflection question kind of comes off that. It's this, uh, what gifts do you have that God can use to love God and people around you? Second reflection question is, what areas of your life is Jesus not king of? Third question, how can you use your house to love God and people? Question number four, have you put up any walls to the broken? I should, probably should have. I typed that up while I was up in the computer about five minutes before service started. Have you put any walls in between the, the broken and Jesus? We're going to have... Three, four, five minutes. I'm going to go back there. i got to plug my phone in, so it's going to be kind of silent here for a second until I get music going. But I want you just to reflect on these things. Uh, maybe if you feel comfortable, talk to the person next to you about some of these things. And uh, let, let just God work through that. So we'll have four, three, four minutes on that. I'll come back up, give a couple announcements, and then we'll close off here. So take some time to reflect. God, we thank you that you are a God who loves and cares uh, that you're not a God who just accepts the most elite and the most super religious, but you call all people to repentance under your name. We thank you for that. That you love us and you care about us enough to send us your son Jesus to walk among us and be with us. So we pray that Mark 2 will change us. While it's not necessarily new information and it's not necessarily a new text we haven't heard before, just pray that, uh, that it'll help us understand how Jesus is king of our life and we are not and we should submit to that. Pray that these questions pushed into our hearts and prompted us uh, in ways that, that, uh, that will lead to change and to application. We pray for our homecoming week coming up, even though it's going to be untraditional and different and slightly out of the box. Uh, we pray that you still work in it. We're glad that you're still God and we don't have to have control over everything you do. So we just pray that you move and work. We pray that uh, Saturday night from 5 to 7, 
Uh, this place will be packed with people, our friends and our family, people who don't know Jesus, but will be able to come to a comfortable environment uh, just to hear some music and have some uh, food and fellowship together. Pray for that, and we just pray for our service on Sunday, that you'll move within it and convict and change our lives. We love you so much. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.